today the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 4. Thank you so much, Stacey. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 4, it says, I thank my God always for you because of the grace of God which was given you in Christ Jesus, so that in everything you were exceedingly enriched in Him, in all speech, empowered by the spiritual gifts and in all knowledge with insight into faith. In this way, our testimony about Christ was confirmed and established in you so that you were not lacking in any spiritual gift which comes from the Holy Spirit as you eagerly wait with confident trust for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ when He returns. A lot of words. I'm going to unpack that in a second. And He will also confirm you to the end, keeping you strong and free of any accusation so that you will be blameless and beyond reproach in the day of the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank God for that. Number nine, uh, verse nine, God is faithful. Say, God is faithful. He is reliable, trustworthy, and ever true to his promise. He can be depended on. Mm, I need a resounding amen. And through him, you were called in a fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise for that incredible passage? Rich, lots of things that Paul is trying to teach the church in Corinth. But Paul is writing back to the church in Corinth and the context of this is that the reason why he is writing this letter is because there were lots of big pastoral issues. The church had, uh, some of the leaders had sent word to him and said, Paul, can you please help us? There are lots of pastoral issues. We've got big stuff going on. There are divisive factions. People were stirring up trouble in the church. There were contentions. There was persecution. Uh, there was pride issues. People, you know, arguing with each other. There, there was immorality. Uh, there were marriage issues. There were divorce issues. Stuff that was potentially threatening to divide and derail God's plan for the church. And the leaders and the city of Corinth at the time of the, the writing were feeling really demoralized. They were feeling like they were, they were pushing mud uphill. You know that expression? Like they were pushing mud uphill. And life can sometimes make us feel like no matter how hard we're trying, we're getting nowhere. How many of you are with me? How many of you got issues in your life? Me and three other people. Come on. How many of you got issues in your life? Now, if you're here today and maybe you feel like there's stuff going on in your life and it might not be your personal issues, it might be that other people you're connected to have issues and now they've become your issues. How many of you with me? Like, do you know what I mean? It's not like you've got issues, but the people that you're close to, the people that you love have issues and now they've become your issues. And at times you're maybe thinking to yourself, God, are you even in this? Where are you in all of this? Paul writes this epic letter to address some of the questions that the leaders had that, God, are you even in this church? Like there's so many things happening. It feels like we're all falling apart. And yet God uh, speaks through Paul and, and essentially the whole crux of this first section of one Corinthians 1 is simply this, that in spite of it all, God is faithful. That is, the, if I could summarize this first chunk of scripture, it's essentially this, that in spite of it all, God is faithful. Now, sometimes it feels like when all our issues have come to light, maybe some of it is, is not our own choosing. Some of it is, let's be honest, our own issues are because of our own stupidity, right? It can feel like, God, are you even in, in, in my life right now? God, where are you? And yet Paul opens this letter to the church in Corinth and he reminds them way before addressing the issues, he reminds them that God has given them all the grace, all the spiritual gifts, all the advocacy they need to have confidence that when they stand before him, they'll stand righteous, not because of their works, but because of their faith and that God is faithful to them, always was and always will be. And I love what the Message Bible writes, the, the, the retranslation of 1 Corinthians 1 in verse 9, it says this, God himself is right alongside to keep you steady and on track. Oh, I need to hear that when I've got issues in my life. Until things are all wrapped up by Jesus, God, who got you started in this spiritual adventure, shares with us the life of his son and our master, Jesus. He will never give up on you. Say, he will never give up on you. Never forget that. I sense prophetically today to speak on the thought, he will never give up on you. If there's anything that Paul wants to remind people of is this, that God is faithful, he will never give up on you, and don't you ever forget that. I don't know who needs to hear this today, but you need to hear these three statements from the book of Corinthians. God is faithful, he will never give up on you, never forget that. 
So today, if you're in a season where you feel like maybe your finances are crumbling, maybe your career is stalled, maybe you're in a dead-end job, you need to hear this today. God is faithful. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. Today, if you're watching this and you're home unwell, and maybe you have a diagnosis of a chronic health condition, and maybe you don't feel like God knows or no, no, no God cares, I want to remind you, God is faithful. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. Maybe your life right now is full of relational issues. Your marriage is struggling. There's tension, conflict in your home. Maybe there's issues with a loved one. He wants to remind you that God is faithful. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. And maybe you're here and you've made mistake after mistake after mistake. You're living in the realities of the consequences of the choices of your life. I want to remind you that God has never abandoned you. That God is faithful. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. Why is this revelation so critical? Why did Paul see it so fitting to, before even addressing the issues in the city of Corinth, he assures them of this? Because Paul knew that deep down inside of all of us, we harbor silent fears, don't we? We harbor silent fears that God's actually not going to be there for us. That he's actually, he's actually too repulsed by the issues of our lives. That, 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 he, that he maybe he, he just wants to draw away from us because we're not good enough, we're not worthy. That we'll be abandoned by God because of our dysfunctions. That we'll be rejected by God because of our mess. That we'll be forgotten by him because we've maybe missed our opportunities and didn't step down in faith when he asked us to. That we'll be overlooked by God because we have passed our expiry date and we're now too old to, to serve him. Maybe we just have silent fears that God's not going to be there in seasons of transition or maybe when we have to step into something, God's not going to be there for us. And I just want to say this to you today. If they're your secret fears, God wants you to know that God is faithful. He'll never give up on you and never forget that. See, there is times and seasons in our lives where we need to remind, be reminded there is a renewed invitation. There is a renewed invitation that God wants you to, you to, to, to pull you back into the space where you have a revelation that He's faithful. That He will never give up on you. And he doesn't want you to forget that. Maybe some of you are transitioning from seasons where you're in the comfort of a boat to stepping out into the discomfort of the water. God wants to remind you, keep your eyes on him because he's faithful. He'll never give up on you. Come on, are you out there? That, that, he, that he wants you to remember that he, even though you're stepping out of the boat and, and, and it feels like you're, you're in a season of transition, he wants you to remember he will never give up on you. The book of Joshua accounts for a character by the name of Joshua. He was in a season of transition. And his great fear in this season of transition was that, God, where are you? God, are you even going to be with me as I'm stepping into something? For those of you that are in college, you're, you're transitioning to an incredibly huge year. Your year will never be the same again. This will be like no other year you ever had. And sometimes we have secret fears when we're stepping into something. Maybe we're going from single to married or from married, no kids to you know, and, and double income and, and living the life to now, you know, first kid, single income and like no sleep, right? Uh, we, we may be transitioning seasons. Maybe you're, you're going from married back to single again. I don't know what that season of life you're in. Maybe you've raised kids and now you're an empty nester. Maybe you're full-time working, now you're a retiree. The, the constant question in transition is, God, are, are you going to be there for me? Yeah. I, 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 are you still going to be? Joshua 1 verse 1, it says this, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. God is so direct sometimes. Yeah. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I am giving them, the children of Israel, and every place that the sole of your foot will tread, I have given you as I said to Moses. Now you're going to imagine being Joshua, right? For 40 years, all that he's known is Moses' leadership. Now, God is dumping this assignment on him to transition. This is a little, small, tiny assignment, right? This is transition millions of Israelites from being wilderness wanderers for 40 years to become an army overnight. How many of you know that is a radical transition? Like suddenly, he has got to transition these wilderness wandering, manna picking, quail defeathering people into being battle ready within a couple of days. Now, he, 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 had, he had nothing to go by apart from a 40 day glimpse of the promises of God 40 years ago. Now, who can blame Joshua if he thought of himself across those four decades of wandering around the wilderness? God, it's, it's, you've left us. Like I saw the promises, but after four decades, surely it's, it's not gonna happen anymore. And now suddenly the transition, and you know what transitions make us feel like we're in no man's land? Hello? 
caught between what was and what will be. Transition is where you've got to leave behind where you were, but you're not quite living in where you need to be. And I feel this prophetically for some people. You're watching this and maybe you're in the middle season like Joshua. He's left the promise, he's left the wilderness, but he's not quite entered in the promised land yet. And he's questioning, God, are you even there? Are you even with me? Maybe you've moved states or you've moved countries or maybe you've even recently moved churches. Suddenly, bang, we're in lockdown. You can't even come to church. And you're wondering, God, have I made the right decision? And you're in a season of transition. I want you to know that God was reminding you that God is faithful. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. Joshua had all these secret questions in the season of transition. In fact, in Joshua chapter 5, the pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus is what we believe, appears before him in Joshua 5 holding a sword in his hand. So much so that Joshua looks at at this God appearance, this God encounter, and asks him, I'm not so sure about you. You're very unfamiliar. Are you for us or against us? A strange question. I'm not so sure about you. I believe that Joshua was voicing the very questions of his own soul. The very own questions of his own soul in the sense that I'm in a season of transition. God, are you even here with me? No wonder God said this in Joshua 1 verse 5. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. What was God saying? Never forget, Joshua. I'm promising you to be faithful. And I'm never giving up on the promise. See, how we continue into the days ahead is dependent on how confident you are about whether God is with you. If you're in a season of transition right now, how you continue, if you're in a season of uncertainty, how you continue into the days ahead is dependent on whether you're confident about whether God is with you, how you respond to that recommended treatment for that sickness, whether you continue in great fear or great anxiety or with peace and calm is dependent completely on whether you're confident that God is faithful, that he'll never leave you or forsake you. Come on, are you out there? Whether you take, when, when you take that role on at work or step into that new ministry or settle into that, that, that new church from another church, how you experience that is completely dependent on how confident you are on whether God is faithful and whether he'll leave you or forsake you. How you're feeling about the world around you right now. No judgment. It's just an evidence of whether you have a revelation or whether he's with you and he's faithful, never forsaking you. Because when push comes to shove, if you don't have that revelation, you'll be deeply fearful. Joshua had, a, had to go on a deeply personal journey of finding a personal revelation that God, you're faithful. You've never given up on me. Your promises are true. And if there are, even after four decades, you're coming back again and you're transitioning me and you will never leave me or forsake me. If you're here today and the sense in you is that you've been waiting a really long time, God has not given up on you and he doesn't want you to forget that because God is faithful. And a resounding amen. So that's for you if you're in a season of transition. I feel prophetically to speak into that. But if you're here today and maybe you're in a season where you feel like time is running out a little. Like maybe time has gone on and it's been a really long time since the last time God spoke to you. And maybe God spoke to you a really long time ago and he's given you promises, given you great dreams, he's given you things that that he's put on your heart that he would fulfill. But over time, it's starting to feel a little bit like, oh man, God, I think you're running out of time because, uh, because you you, you know, I'm getting a little older. It's 2022. I'm celebrating my blank, 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 blank birthday this year. It's like I'm running out of time. The account of Joshua is paralleled by Joshua's old mate, Caleb. You see, when Joshua and Caleb were younger fellas, they were two of 12 spies that Moses sent out when they first got to the wilderness to go spy out the land that God had promised to give them. Moses said to them, go spy out the land, take a good 40 days to scope it out. 40 days, go and check out the land, right? Eat the food of the land, look through every nook and cranny, go and play around the paddocks, go check it out, go suss out the promises of God. And after 12 spies that went and came back to give a report on their findings, 10 of them, 10 of the 12 spies said, no, 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 we, 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 it's too hard. There are too many giants there, too much opposition. We really can't go in to possess all of the things that God had promised that he would give us. Like God had promised them. And they said, no, we, we actually, there, there, there's, there's too many challenges there. But only two guys came back to say, come on, let's just take that land. Of those two guys, one of them was Joshua, but the second guy was Caleb. Now, you would imagine, like Caleb also, like Joshua, come on, we're ready to go, fellas. Let's just, let's just march right in there and we'll face whatever challenges come our way. 40 days, they had an opportunity to taste and see that the Lord is good. 
But in the 40 days, because 10 overruled the two, they had to spend 40 years wandering the wilderness. I wonder today how many of us have spent years wandering spiritual wildernesses because of a few days of doubt. I wonder how many of us have spent an entire generation's worth of living in mediocrity because of, of a few moments worth of unbelief. 40 days. 40 days and they came back and said, no, no, we, we can't do it. So they spent 40 years. Now, you can imagine Caleb thinking in those four decades, surely God's given up on me. Now, he's in his 80s. And him and alongside the millions of Jews are now at the border between the wilderness and the promised land. And he's not quite the go-getter 40-year-old he used to be when he first spied out the land. He's now 85 years old. Now, you could forgive Caleb for thinking, at 85, I've run out of time to fulfill the promises of God. God, you were faithful for me when I was 40, but I think you've probably given up on me by now because I'm not the same man I used to be. I'm a little rusty with my gifts and callings. I, 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 you know, well, I've, I've got like hip issues right now. Come on. You can, you can imagine Caleb having all of these conversations with God, but God comes back and reminds Caleb that God is faithful, that I will never give up on you. Never forget that. Because in Joshua 14 verse six, it says this, now the people, of Judah approached Joshua at Gilgal and Caleb son of Jephunneh the Kenizzite said to him, you know what the Lord said to Moses the man of God at Kadesh Barnea about you and me. I was 40 years old and Moses the servant of the Lord sent me from Kadesh Barnea to explore the land. Verse 10, now then, turn to someone and say now then, just as the Lord promised 40 years ago, he has kept me alive for 45 years since the time he said this to Moses while Israel moved about in the wilderness. So here I am today, 85 years old, reporting for duty. How awesome is that? I am still as strong as the day Moses sent me out. Oh, come on, I wanna speak like that when I'm 85 years old. I'm just as vigorous. Turn to someone and say, I'm just as vigorous. I love that word. I love that word. I want to be just as vigorous to go out to battle now as I was then. Now, give me this hill country that the Lord promised me that day. You yourself heard then that the Anakites were there and their cities were large and fortified, but the Lord helping me, I will drive them out. Just, he's 85 years old. Then Joshua blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron as his inheritance. This is a response of an 85-year-old man. He's no longer 40, but he's got a revelation that God is faithful, that not, God never gives up on us. Come on. See, I want to encourage you today. If you're feeling like time has run out on you, even when you're done, down to your last breath, God has not given up on you. Not on earth, not in eternity, never. See, the reason why this revelation is so important for us, why can we be certain that God will never give up on us? Because you were created in his image. And if God were to give up on you, he'd be giving up on himself. Catch that. God will never give up on you because, you see, Caleb could have been forgiven for thinking, I'm, I'm old. I'm old. Why, like God, I'm a little past it. Can I say this to you today? You don't get to choose how long you live, but you get to choose how you live today. You don't get to choose when your last day is going to be. Your last day could be 30, 40 years from now. You don't get to have a say when your last day is, but you get to choose how you live today. I want to live today saying, I'm vigorous. I'm ready for this. I'm reporting for duty. Start living with purpose. Your season might look different because taking the hill country as an 85-year-old might be different at your age than if you were to take it at 40. But nonetheless, God's not given up on you, so don't you give up on God. God is faithful. God has not given up on you. Yeah. Never forget that. See, I want to remind someone today, if you feel like time is running out, time is in God's hands, not yours. Yeah. Don't you take it on yourself to decide when time is done for you. Yeah. That's God's business. You just make the most of the day God has given you yeah. today. Yeah. So if you're transitioning like Joshua, remember that God is faithful. He will never give up on you. Yeah. Don't you forget it. But if you feel like time is running out like Caleb, God also wants to remind you that God is faithful. Yeah. Hello? Hello? He will never give up on you. Don't you forget that. But maybe you're here today and the sense that you have is, okay, that, 
is for the Joshua's and that's for the Caleb's. But my situation, PK, is that I've made far too many mistakes. I, I, I've, I've messed up too many times for God to come around again. I, I've, I, I've just screwed it up too many times. I've fallen too many times. And if I was God, I would have given up on me a really long time ago. Maybe you're watching through the screen today and you're not, and even at church and you're, you're, you're sitting there watching this and you go, yeah, okay, that's nice for everybody else. God is faithful and God has not given up on them. Never forget that. That's great for everybody else. But PK, you don't understand my life. I've tried too many times to live like a good Christian. I've tried too many times to get it right and I still keep screwing it up. If that is you, I want to remind you that God is faithful. Yes. He will never give up on you. Yes. Never forget that. Last week, I spoke about a guy by the name of Abraham. And Abraham was a unique character in God, a unique character. I don't know what your personal situation is. Maybe you feel like you've disqualified yourself. Maybe you feel like you've made some choices, life-altering choices that have life-altering consequences. You know what? Sometimes we do stuff in life that will cause us to have natural consequences that we've got to live with. That, that there's absolutely no going, you know, no, no running away from that. That maybe you're here, there's some legal ramifications that you're living in right now. Maybe there's some lawsuits, criminal charges, bankruptcies, you know, a, a, a divided family, whatever that is. It, they're all realities that we've got to live with. But when it comes to God, regardless of what your natural consequences are, He's faithful. He's not given up on you. Never forget that. Because in the book of Genesis, I preached on this, on this guy last week here at our Myri uh, campus and online. And I spoke about how. God speaks to Abraham, who was this old guy, and alongside his wife Sarah, were unable to have children. God promises to, have, to give him a child. And when they hadn't conceived of a child after some years, he sleeps, has an affair with his maidservant, Hagar. And Hagar conceives of this child and calls him Ishmael. Now, having an affair with your wife's servant is a significant lapse in judgment when you've had an encounter with God. And he's given you the promise. But sometimes when we, we trust God with the what, but we don't trust him with the when, we feel like we've got to help God along a little. Now, have you ever tried to help God along a little? Right, like God, you, 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 I think you need some help. You need to get your act together. Let me help you along a little bit. I'm going to make it happen myself. You know what I'm talking about? Well, this was, this was what Abraham did. And we read, with, we read with a heavy heart the scripture in Genesis 16, verse 15. It says, so Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore, Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. A tragic verse because what it should have read was, so Sarah bore Abram a son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hmm. And Abram named his son Isaac. That's how it should have read. This was nothing like what God had in mind. This was a mistake of the highest order. It was not what was in God's heart. When God pulled him out of a tent, I said, Abraham, look up in the stars, look up in the sky, see the number of stars, and so shall your descendants be. This was not what God had in mind. Sometimes things happen in life through our own mistakes, through our own lapses in judgment, maybe through our own dysfunctions, that was just not what God had in mind for our lives. And it's in that season where we can be tempted to feel like God's actually given up on us, where God has actually left the building, where we are irrecoverable, irreparable, irreconcilable. We use all of these big words to simply say there is no hope. If you're in a season right now where you feel like you've made mistakes that are too far back for you to come back from, I want you to know that God is faithful, that he will never leave you. Never forget that. Because God is faithful even when we're unfaithful. And it was a difficult season because when you think about who Ishmael was, this is, this is who Ishmael was. Genesis 16 verse 10, it says, the angel added, speaking to Hagar, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Now speaking about Ishmael, he will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. Some scholarly traditions view Ishmael to be the founder of the Arabic nations today. Some scholars hold the view that the prophet Muhammad was one of Ishmael's descendants. If you want to Think about it from Abraham's side. You would have thought that there's no coming back from this mistake, Abraham. That how God has given you a promise, bro. You had an encounter with God himself and you could epically stuff it up like that. 
But how many of you know that God never gives up on us? Even when we make our greatest mistakes, God has not given up on us. Only four of you are convinced. Because as I keep turning the pages of the Bible, Genesis 21, it says this, verse 1. You would have thought that God said, no, the deal's off, Abraham. It's too big a mistake, epically. See you later. I'm done with you. And yet Genesis 21, verse 1, and the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. I don't even know God doesn't change his promises. And the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived, ah, come on now, and bore Abraham a son in his old age at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. God is faithful. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. Can we give God a big shout of praise? You would have thought after the birth of Ishmael, all bets are off. Your mistakes are too big to cover, Abraham. You'll be recorded in history as the guy that had it all and blew it all. And yet God is faithful. He will never give up on us. And he wants you to never forget that. And not only does God never give up on us, he turns our mistakes into miracles. He turns our mistakes into, some of you are thinking, okay, not, not only is God gonna give up on me, He's gonna write me off forever. If you're watching through the screen, I feel this prophetically to someone, he's gonna turn your mistakes into miracles because God didn't just, not just, he didn't overlook what Abraham did, but he held true to the promises. What I want you to know is that God's plan for your life is far greater than all your best efforts to undermine it. Because when it comes to God, he will fulfill his calling and promise for your life. If not in this life, he will do so in the generations to come. Because as I begin to unpack and unfold more of the pages of the Bible, I see four generations later, Abraham's great grandson, Joseph, finds himself turned upon by his own jealous brothers. And they stripped the coat his father Jacob gave him, dipped it in animal blood, and told their father Joseph, told their father Joseph that told their, told their father Jacob that Joseph had been eaten by wild animals, and they threw him in the pit to die. How many of you know that is a horrendous episode? That is like family feud to the max. There was absolutely no way out for this young boy Joseph. His father now thinks he's dead. His brothers are thrown into the pit, and now they're chilling. Not far from the pit, having their lunch. How many of you know that's a family dysfunction right there? But God turns mistakes into miracles. Y'all are not going to believe this when I read this. Genesis 37. As they, being Joseph's brothers, sat down to eat their meal after they threw their brother in the pit, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Verse 26. Judah said to his brothers, what will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, I've got a better idea. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And his brothers thought, oh, that's a good idea, isn't it? Are you catching what's happening here? Abraham, on the side of his promise, the lineage Abraham begets Isaac, who begets Jacob, who begets Joseph, great-grandson. His great-grandson finds himself now in the pit, betrayed by his own brothers. There is no way out for him to survive, barring a miracle. But God turns our greatest mistakes into miracles because on the mistake side of his lineage, Abraham begets Ishmael, who three generations later, his own descendants, the Ishmaelites, became the very people that would rescue Joseph out of, you're not getting this. God uses Abraham's mistake 
to redeem Abraham's promise, don't you tell me that God has given up on you because he's faithful to you. And if you're here today and you're thinking, I've made far too many mistakes that God can't redeem me from this, it may seem that it might, it might even be too late in your lifetime. But I promise you, if God's promised you, your lineage is sanctified. He will look after your children, your children's children, and your children's children after them. Today, God is faithful. He will never leave you. <sighs> never forget that. Because I'm so tired of so many Christians living like God is not faithful. God has given up on them. That is all done. That is all over. I just attend church. I just get by. I just maybe just read my Bible every now and then. If you would only know how involved God is with your life in all the messes of transition, in all of your thoughts and fears that time is running out, in all of the mistakes and messes and dysfunctions of your life, if you only knew how much God wants to be involved with your family story, if you only knew how much God wants to come and interject into the narrative of your life to prove himself faithful to you today, musicians, you can join me. You got to understand that you have a God yeah. that is faithful, yeah. That's right. that He will never leave you, never give up on you. And He doesn't want you to forget that. Turn to someone and say, God is faithful. Turn to the other person and say that He will never give up on you. And say to yourself, never forget that. Can we give Jesus a big shout of praise for that? We'll just stand to your feet right across this room online. You can just begin to shift. If you're watching this in your living room, you can stand up. If you're watching it in your bed and if you're able to, stand up too. Because there's something about just this change in our physical posture that readies us to receive what the Holy Spirit wants to do in this Word. And right now, I want to give you an opportunity if you're watching online to receive this faithful God. The God that we see in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, proven Himself through different seasons and eras, through different people, culminating in the coming of Jesus. And even in the days of when the church was birthed, there were issues and people were confused and wondering whether God was there. God has always been there. And right now for you, you need to know that God came as Jesus, who was called Emmanuel, God with us, because He wants to be with you. Today, I wanna give you an opportunity to invite Jesus into your life so you can be in right standing with God. And as Paul had assured the church in Corinth, that all of the advocacy that you need to be right with God is found in Jesus. You can be assured of that today, but you need to receive Him. And so today, if you need to open up your heart to Jesus, you want Him to forgive you of all that you've done, give you a brand new start. I'm gonna lead you in prayer right now and everyone in the room is gonna help me pray this prayer with you. So come on, dear Lord Jesus, we thank you that you died and you rose again for me. Lord Jesus, I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins and to wipe away all of my past. Lord Jesus, I invite you into my life as my personal Lord and Savior. In your name I pray. And everyone said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen. And so if you made that decision, please log on to nationschurch.com forward slash my decision. We want to journey with you. Don't do this Christian faith on your own. We want to be in touch with you. If you live in Perth or maybe you want to visit the Myri campus or any of our campuses, we would love to journey with you. We've got a team here that would love to give you a Bible, pray with you, contact us. But if you live outside of the city of Perth or maybe outside of Western Australia, we want to journey with you through the internet. We've got our team that's willing and ready to talk with you, pray with you via Zoom screens and different means like that. But God bless you. Stay online right now as God begins to minister to you. To everybody else in the room and online, just bow your heads, close your eyes for now. I don't know where you're at today, but maybe the sense that you have sometimes is that God has given up on you, that God maybe has distanced Himself from you. Maybe you're just here saying, God, I don't, I don't feel like you're anywhere right now. I feel a little lost. I'm in a season of transition. It all feels uncomfortable. You're like Joshua. You know, if God were to appear 
in front of you right now, you'd be saying, are you for me or against me? Who, who, who even are you? The secret doubts that God is going to be with you if you to step up and step into all that God has for you. Others here, you're having Caleb conversations. You've been made to wait a lot of years. 40 years Caleb had to wait. After the 40 days of tasting all of the spoils of the promised land, he was made to wait 40 years. And in those 40 years, the God, are you even still there? Are you still the God of my dreams as a 40-year-old man to be a conqueror? Are you still going to fulfill what you placed on my lifetime as passed me by? I'm not the same girl. I'm not the same guy I used to be. You need to know that God is faithful. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. Others here might be watching through the screen. You've felt like God has distanced Himself from you because you feel like you've made far too many mistakes. If God can redeem Abraham's descendant, Joseph, with Abraham's other descendants, the Ishmaelites, He can redeem. Whatever mistake that you've made, His promises are still true. So today, all that I want everyone in the room and online to do is to allow the Holy Spirit, I can already sense a change in atmosphere, to just begin to seal that word in your life right now, that God is faithful. He will never give up on you. Never forget that. If that is you today, begin to lift your hands like you're worshiping. Sealing the promise of His faithfulness over your life. Healing promises over your life.